Hey everybody, Joey here. Hey, I wanted to expose you all to a project you may or may not have heard about. And uh, has to deal with something called LoRa uh, and mesh networking. And I kind of had some thoughts about how that might work with, uh, as an adjunct potentially, to Packet Radio. So this presentation is USA focused for those of you watching uh, this on my YouTube channel, uh, specifically kind of Colorado, but the ideas behind it should be general, uh, enough for everyone around the world. So if you're watching this from outside of Colorado, welcome aboard. So kind of to set the stage, you know, as ham radio operators, we, you know, respond to events and incidents with lots of gear, lots of heavy gear. Uh, certainly we use a lot more gear for emergencies than we do for you know, like parks on the air activations or work at mountaintops where we put everything in a backpack. When we go to incidents, you know, people are, people have like two or three people that have to lug things out of cars, uh, you know, to do heavy lifts or they're using uh, luggage trolleys to carry things across. So it's, uh, it's, it's really involved uh, with everything, including, you know, setting up masks and power supplies and the whole nine yards. And uh, if you've not looked around recently, most of the participants uh, are f getting on in age. <laughs> they, are, they are retired, they're pensioners, they're no longer working, uh, and it makes uh, kind of this heavy lifting and set up things a bit of a, a bit problematic. So I was thinking about all of these and I wondered, you know, I wonder if there's something else that we can do, some, some technology that we could leverage to maybe make this a little bit easier. And that's when I came across something that's been around for a while called LoRa. LoRa is an abbreviation for, for long range. It's a long range radio protocol and it, uh, it works really well, uh, certainly from my tests. Uh, it can go several city blocks up to uh, kind of like 130 miles line of sight uh, that was achieved in New Zealand. Now to kind of put that in perspective, you know, ATs that we bring along with us uh, are typically about 50 miles line of sight. Um, it does do, uh, it, the way it works is it passes uh, text messages, essentially, a slow text across. It has a 288 character message uh, and it includes, you know, sensor data, environmental data, uh, and position information across it. So if you're familiar with APRS, there's a lot of similarities to it. In the U.S., it operates in the 915 megahertz um, ISM band. Uh, it's, v there are some ham radio overrides, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, it's very low power usage, resulting in very long run times. Uh, most of these devices will run, you know, they're measured in days to weeks, and that's assuming you don't have solar set up. If it, you have solar with it, it'll run indefinitely, which makes it super awesome for off-grid and disaster scenarios, and kind of that disaster scenario is where I'm thinking about, but it can also be uh, places that are really hard to reach, like mountain canyons, um, things like that. These, uh, uh, the hardware for this uh, also has the ability to do Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and GPS, depending on the model and type you get. And they're cheap, you know, $8, I've seen them as low as $4.55, um, to kind of a full complete board for $45. Doesn't include battery or the case, typically, um, but still, you're, it's, a, it's cheap, it's, it is inexpensive. Um, you know, we're kind of talking Raspberry Pi prices here, if not even cheaper. So this is what they look like. On the left is something by Rack, uh, and it's, a, it's called a Wise Block is the, the uh, form factor it fits into there on the left. And you can see just by looking at it, it's got places for solar, and there's some GPS and other stuff it could put in there as well. The one on the right is uh, T-Beam's, kind of what started this whole thing. This T-Beam's kind of interesting because it has, uh, you know, the ant built-in antenna soldered right to the board. It's got a GPS unit on board. Uh, on the, right below the GPS, you'll see a little small picture of the backside. It's got an 18650 battery holder on the back, uh, and this thing runs for days on end. Uh, and these things are tiny. I mean, these are these are very tiny, stick of gum kind of size things. Uh, they also come with dis with displays on them. So there's a, a LilyGo board. Uh, this one's actually 2.4 gigahertz as opposed to 914. But uh, here's a, Lily, a LilyGo. It's got a nice little board on it. There's a, a Helltac on the right. It's one of the cheaper boards um, with it as well. They all have you know USB power supplies on them, so you can power them directly, or you can hook them up to external batteries, you know, LiPo battery or something similar. There's lots of cool stuff we can do with it. But if you add software to it and the software I'm going to talk about is Meshtastic, uh, they really come alive. So Meshtastic.org, uh, it's an open source project. Uh, it's essentially a modern version of APRS. Um, the project itself uh, aims to create a LoRa mesh different from, from 
uh, Laura Wan, you might have heard of Laura, it's a mesh network using off this, this off the shelf hardware. Um, you know, you pair it with your phone or a computer or an iPad over Bluetooth, and then you can have direct conversations to a real person with it. So you have one person to one of these boards, and then uh, that board communi with over Bluetooth uh, or Wi-Fi, uh, and then that uh, board then will send out and do the, the LoRa protocol, the long-range protocol in the 915 megahertz band. Uh, it's kind of neat, so it, it automatically rebroadcasts messages, so it creates a mesh that anyone in the group can receive. Um, so it doesn't matter how far away, as long as somebody can hear somebody else, uh, the message gets through. You can see up to 80 nodes at a time, um, and that's due to a memory constraint. You can't go past 80. But what happens then is uh, once you hit like 80, the 81st node, the oldest node that it hasn't seen drops off. Repeaters aren't included in that. Yes, there's a thing called repeaters. Repeaters don't... Uh, don't show up as a node because they don't pass information about themselves. They just sit there and repeat. Um, everything is encrypted, which is really cool. So uh, I'll talk about encrypted channels here in a bit and, and this thing called a ham override for more power. But uh, you, the channels that it has available to it that you would be talking on are encrypted by default. Um, when you select uh, a licensed operator, so a ham radio, amateur radio operator, uh, it does a few things, one of which is it sets your call sign as the node name and it unencrypts it and it allows you to step up the power and actually use higher uh, gain antennas. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And you can do remote administration. So in theory, you could pepper the field with these things. Um, and you could remote administ uh, remotely administrate uh, all of these things. Uh, so it's really cool. Uh, kind of a well, I'll keep talking here. So it's in use worldwide. Uh, it's heavy in use in the Ukraine. Um, it's a bunch of people in New Zealand that are using them as well. Uh, it, it's very effective even in cities. Um, in Calgary, uh, there's a repeater up on the side of one of the mountains and it covers the entire town uh, of Cal the city of Calgary. So uh, if you're here in Colorado, you can think of Boulder, Denver, uh, Colorado Springs, Durango, uh, places that you might have uh, the ability to put something up high, uh, you know, maybe up on Grand Mesa, for example, to hit Grand Junction. And, uh, and that one repeater will be able to service places. So if you're in the city and you, you, can't, um, you can't break out um, for a couple blocks, uh, you might be able to line a site see a repeater, which is the way we do operations here anyway. Uh, it's already in use by search and rescue groups in various militaries, um, uh, some with custom firmware based on it. Uh, it has a built-in map of nodes, so you can see everybody that you can hear um, or that gets repeated over to you. Uh, you can connect it to the internet, uh, sort of works like a VPN connection, uh, if you will, to connect geographically separate networks. So uh, if, for example, say I'm, I have a network in, say, Boulder, Colorado, and I want to talk to somebody in Colorado Springs, um, there's a mechanism by which uh, we c you could connect those two separate networks and make one larger network um, for that. So for ham radio use, uh, you know, maybe that's useful, maybe it's not. Uh, really depends on you know what problems you're trying to solve, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the next last bullet I'm here is full-time solar-powered nodes and repeaters are a thing. Uh, these draw so little power, uh, you can put a uh, a small size uh, lipo battery in them and a solar panel, and they will last forever <laughs> until the equipment breaks down. So what do they look like? Here's what they look like. Here's some examples with cases. So f on the left, uh, it's a pocket mesh. By the way, that's these two things that you see on your screen. They're the size of two Tic Tac uh, containers put together. So they're small. Um, and this one on the left is the big one. I actually have a smaller version of the one on the left. Um, and it's tiny. Uh, and I get amazing range from it. But one on the left has got a waterproof case on it. The one on the right is... Uh, it's got the display screen out, so it's not that waterproof. But it's very rugged cases for these things. And they're small. I said they're small. They're, they have rechargeable batteries in them. They charge right up. Uh, on the left is a repeater. Look, at, That's the size of a tissue box, the small size square tissue boxes on the left. And you can see it's not a very big solar panel that uh, is used to supply it. Uh, in fact, this is the one I think they actually have uh, in use in Calgary. I think on the right uh, is a 
a communicator device developed, I believe it's by some folks in Germany, uh, and it's uh, it just uses the display screen, and they've they've custom made a, a a nice little keyboard for it. So if you just want to have a little communicator, you could take it with you. Now, I like most people in ham radio. I'm getting kind of old. It's a little hard for me to see that screen on a regular basis. So a phones uh, better suited for myself. But just so you know, they exist. And then here's what your Go Kit looks like. Uh, you know, these things are super light. You can put a whole bunch of things in there. Uh, if you're powering them by uh, by batteries, you can put a battery charger in there, um, and you know, you're good to go. It's you know, you're not lugging around heavy boxes for these things. If you want to put them in your car, uh, this picture is enlarged significantly. These things are small. Uh, it's just a couple centimeters across. Um, as you could tell probably by the screw head size and that little tiny switch in there. Um, but this is uh, something that somebody makes for the car. It's just a, just a case for it that allows you to power it. Uh, it can have a battery inside, can have a GPS unit inside. Uh, you know, it has connections for an external antenna. Um, this particular unit with the battery, if you're not broadcasting GPS, um, just by the battery that goes in it is, I think it's 26 days <coughs> of power um, without being powered by your car, but you can just plug this right into your car and have a charge every time you're running. So here is some conversations uh, that you can have. So this is what the software looks like, and there's no way for me to get rid of that <laughs> private relay is active message you're probably seeing in the top right hand corner. Thank you, Apple, for disrupting my presentation. Uh, so this is some of the software. This happens to be the uh, Apple version of the software. And you can see I've connected. In this case, I've connected to a base radio. Uh, and I'm subscribed to the mesh. And down at the bottom, you can see there's a section for messages, uh, nodes, mesh map, uh, and settings. I'll cover some of these in a little bit. So this is what, uh, when you click on a node, you want to get more information about a node, what it look like. It'll give you the short name. That's at n-p for nv0n-portable. Uh, it tells you the kind of board it's using, your signal strength there, the voltage from the battery, uh, and some other information. You can be able to click in on these and, and see a list of running positions. So if that node, which this one was, uh, was uh, submitting GPS information, you know, it would show across uh, in there. And then it also has device metrics. So if there was some sensor data, so remember this stuff was all, uh, uh, the, the whole LoRa, I neglected to say the whole LoRa concept was meant for Internet of Things and remote sensors, you know, for be things on farms or maybe attaching to cattle. Um, anyway, uh, that's what this looks like. If I'm going to have a conversation, here's, uh, here's some conversation back and forth, left and right. So on the left, you'll see that uh, in the blue at the top, it says zero. That's channel zero. You can have specific channel names. That's a default channel. I didn't overwrite it. And so I went back and forth and just sent some information. And you can see that it was acknowledged by somebody. So I know that my message was transmitted somewhere to the mesh. And then on the right uh, is an example of direct. So if you can, uh, if you can actually hear the other node, you can have a direct conversation outside of a public channel or public talk group. So if you're from a ham radio side, you can think of the left side, the public channel, as talking on a repeater. And you can hear everybody talking on the repeater. And the one on the right is going point to point, radio to radio. So in the settings, and there are many, uh, you can go into the user component and you can set uh, the long name for a station. Um, and you can also set a, a four character short name um, to override this. And so it could be anything in here. So you could have your long name could be, you know, YMCA Shelter, uh, you know, East 17th Avenue or something. Uh, and your short name could be like YMCA. Um, and you can configure these on the fly, reprogram these things on the fly. So if you get to some place and you want to set it up, you could do it. Uh, it works also great for portable people. So if you're, if you're going to have people out in the field, um, you know, you could rename this to whatever their tactical call sign is, and then you'll have a short name, and their tactical could be their long, their, uh, their long name. Um, this is true until you get to the licensed operator component, ham radio, which looks like this. If you click that on, um, you'll see specifically what it says here. It sets your node name to your call sign. It broadcasts information every 10 minutes by uh, US FCC regulations. Uh, overrides the frequency and duty cycle and power, so you can, you can crank the sucker up if you want to. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these boards don't have a tremendous a lot of overhead when it comes to transmit power. Um, but certainly, if you're operating in the ham arena, you could throw on m much greater uh, uh, gain antennas and even amplifiers if you were so uh, so inclined to do that. I'm going to suggest, however, that you may not want to do that, and I'll, I'll suggest that later. Um, 
but I will tell you that uh, in us in Austria and Germany, they have uh, quite a few uh, ham where they have these at higher power in the ham radio area, uh, and it works out really well for them. So uh, let's go back to packet radio. So what are the good things about packet radio? You know, digging this. Uh, the, so for people who aren't familiar with how this how this works, oftentimes if there's a disaster, uh, you'll set up. Uh, a shelter station, like there's a big flood or there's a big fire, people are displaced from their homes and businesses, they'll show up at a shelter uh, so they can get some aid for, you know, clothing, food, whatever, they can just take stock. People can check in and find out if their loved ones are there. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, amateur radio emergency services groups will put a packet radio and a voice radio uh, in that location. And so on the packet radio, they can capture uh, who's there, what's happening, um, basic information. I've got 27 people now. I need, I'm looking for information on such and such, um, right? And so these packet stations and radios would be deployed. Uh, so it's not all radio traffic, some of it can go digital. Uh, and so some advantages of doing this, right? It's high power, you can get out from pretty much everywhere if you're lucky as long as you're not in the canyon. Uh, it's very fast transmissions. Uh, you know, you can use large messages, uh, you know, using ICS forms, for example, like FL Digi, um, to send this material across. Uh, if you have a BBS handy, um, you know, you could, you could uh, store messages for later retrieval on this bulletin board system, um, which is really good if you're just checking in that way. You don't, you know, it can be asynchronous communication with it. Uh, and if you've got an RMS node nearby, uh, like if you're hitting, like for example, my node uh, or others, uh, you know, you'll be able to get the wing link fr uh, from this using packet. But there's some problems with it, and you know, as I've talked about some of them already. Like it's, it's expensive. You know, you've got the radio, you've got the modem, you've got an antenna, you've got some power supply, usually with batteries, so you can operate independently. There's training you have to do. Um, there's this whole setup thing. I mean, it's just there's a whole lot of things that you have to do, and because of all this. Uh, for this reliable operation, it becomes heavy. It's cumbersome, so it's kind of car portable, not man portable. People are using APRS uh, somewhat, not that much these days, but they still use it for man portable operations. It requires a ham radio license, so you have to be a ham to use it. Um, certainly, as I said above, it requires time and materials to set up a BBS and uh, an RMS station. You can't typically, and you don't want to, uh, pass any personal data on this connection because it's unencrypted by law and the storage for that is unencrypted and so uh, you know this is a bit of a privacy problem when you're sending people's vitals uh, you know their name their you know their name or or where they lo are located or something similar across unencrypted it's not it's not uh, a good thing to do and oftentimes you can't do it uh, a lot of served agencies won't permit it, and other times served agencies will say, yeah, hey, listen, it's an emergency, so go ahead and send it to us. We're going to bypass the laws. Probably the thing that bothers me the most about this is that there really hasn't been any significant advancement in packet in the last 30 years for the way that Aries teams use this, except for things like FL Dizzy, which is amazing, uh, and the kind of now defunct uh, DRATS, which was uh, basically D-Star, you know, using this over D-Star. So. There's some others that are similar to this, but those are software packages. There's not really anything that's, you know, that, that, that impacts packet in general. I mean, we're still using the same packet modems that were invented 30 years ago. Uh, so let's look at what Mestastic on uh, Mestastic nodes using these cheap uh, LoRa devices. So they're very light, super light, super small, super cheap super long range. Uh, it's open, you know, the software itself is open source, lots of community and hardware manufacturer support um, in these. Um, it, it's, it's emerging technology, so there's lots of attention on it. You can have private channels, assuming you're not using hand bands, you can have private channels uh, up to eight in total. So the first channel zero is typically your default. Um, one that anybody can join and then you know you could have one or two or five just for your own Aries group you know one could be uh, a channel for uh, typical packet operations could be put there another one could be command and control channel um, right so you could do a bunch of one could be a test channel you only use that that channel um, you know for your weekly nets which I don't recommend I recommend you use all the production channels because that's what you want to know works at the time that there's an incident uh, it can do ham only mode uh, for more power uh, you know, you know us ham radio operators. Uh, there's only a few of us, like myself, that like uh, th uh, 
that, that like low power QRP work. Uh, most people want to see how much power they can crank in and see how far they can go. Uh, so that is possible, and there are legitimate use cases for that. If you don't encrypt, uh, if you don't use the ham bands, or use the ham override at least, uh, you can keep the settings, the default where it is, and you can eventually basically set up uh, a public service open mesh for emergencies. So if you pepper the a town with these low cost nodes, uh, people have them running or a repeater or two up at a high place. When disaster strikes, people in the community, if they happen to have these, can just pull them out and have a group conversation when the power's out. Because again, these nodes will last days, if not weeks, assuming they're not solar powered. Um, you know, if you're looking at your phone, then yeah, you may have to power your phone. Your phone will last for a day uh, or so, which is one of the reasons why people like those little little tiny displays because they don't need to have the phone with them. They can do like the, the communicator is great because they can do everything on the, on that. Um, they, you know, there's GPS available uh, either on board uh, and or from you know your phone, your computer, your iPad, whatever. So you're going through. So you've got this. So very much you know, a lot of APRS like stuff. Um, Again, you know, it could be always on. It's got a long battery life. You can have some really nice names uh, with these things. Uh, you can share routing information. So, if, like, if I was at, if I was logged into the YMCA shelter, as an example, uh, you know, you'll be able to see that it's me communicating and where I'm communicating from. Um, so you'll have some of that material available. There's map and position data, which includes tracking. So you can track a vehicle, put it in a vehicle like APRS. You can track a person. Um, and it includes some sensor data, um, sensor data for the node itself, so the battery that you saw earlier, plus if you have extra things added like temperature and whatnot, it could be there too. So, you know, one of the use cases uh, is literally just putting one of these things up on a weather station. Uh, and now you have a weather station that's broadcasting, you know, every couple of minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, whatever you want. Um, It'll broadcast weather data out across this, so you have that uh, up there. Uh, so I mentioned you can use the internet connection, so it uses a software package called M MQTT. Uh, and there's one of these that's available through Meshtastic today that's free to use. And there are some um, fairly new but basic uh, functionality relays available to things like Matrix or Telegram and more. So if you have to, you know, if you have ability to get to the internet, you might be able to, uh, to make use of these as well. There are some cons, though. It's kind of slow. Uh, and that's sort of relative. I should have put slow in quotes here. Like so the default speed is uh, 0 0.67 kilobits per second. It can go as fast on some of the settings to 6.8 to kind of give you an idea, like APRS is 1.2. So, uh, you know, for me, sending back and forth, I can send short messages in three seconds. Uh, you know, the longer the message, the longer it takes to transmit and receive, uh, but acts are cheap. Uh, there are settings, which I didn't show you in the software, that changes the... Um, the frequency and the speed, if you will. Um, and so if you go to short fast, as an example, um, short distance, high speed, you'll get that 6.8 kilobits per second. Uh, the default is something that's called long and fast, which is this 0 0.67. It can actually go to long and very slow, which drops this down to much lower speeds, but you can go much higher distances uh, with this. So I mentioned that it does the short messages, and I suppose that's short in quotes here because it's 288 characters. So APRS is 67, SMS on your phone is 160. Twitter went from 140 to 280, so this is eight characters longer than Twitter. You could pack uh, quite a bit of information into 288 characters, um, you know, when you send stuff across. So some of the downsides, you know, you need several units or repeaters to really make an effective mesh. You know, one repeater can go a long way. There's some other things too, right? You have to figure out. Uh, how um, crowded the band is, and there's some information about uh, how crowded that uh, 915 megahertz channel is, the one that you're using uh, when you look at nodes. Uh, the, the boards themselves can burn out uh, super quick. If you just remove the antenna when the, batter, when the board is powered on, invariably it's going to try to transmit and it'll burn it out and you'll have to get a new board. Um, so, you know, the, the rule of thumb, easy to work around, the rule of thumb is, you know, Never take the never take the antenna off. Uh, if you need to replace the antenna, make sure you take the battery out first. Um, there is no such thing. Well, I shouldn't say that. There is such a thing as store and forward. It's not fully implemented. It's only worked. It's only implemented on some of the boards, and you need to have an external storage with it. It can hold an impressive eleven thousand records, um, but it's not a replacement for what some groups use as this asynchronous BBS kind of thing. It's literally just store and forward. I'm going to hold on to it until I can uh, come back and and uh, find a you know, connection to a node, and then I'll start uh, replaying all this stuff that was stored. 
So could we use this stuff as a packet replacement? Well, it's not really, it's not, you can't really use it to, to replace packet in some use cases, especially when you need the, that BBS for asynchronous communications, passing along messages, wind link support, um, you know, those kind of things. It can, however, Mastasha can be a great adjunct for a low cost, you know, a, a great adjunct to packet. Uh, for what it can do, and it's very low cost. It could be a low cost general public service project that your group can put together and use. Um, you know, it can certainly help with shelters and aid operations where you want to pass some personal information over, you know, an encrypted method. Uh, I mean, there's a huge win there because, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't tell how many times, you know, emergency operations center has, you know, rung me up and said, hey, listen, I need some specific names and addresses of people because I need to, you know, figure out my displace list. And I'm like, you know, I can't, I can't air this over the air. Um, these things are really good for difficult to reach spots like canyons because if you want to get to a canyon, you just put a repeater up somewhere and you can get out. And they're cheap. It's not like, you know, the typical ham radio where we're going to put a repeater up and it's, you know, you've got to put together... Um, uh, you know, you not only have to have all the whole repeater things and a massive antenna, and you have to have, uh, you know, duplexers and cans, all sorts of stuff. You know, you don't need any of that. It's, it's literally a $100 box that you stick up somewhere, you know. Uh, it's, this is a great thing for STEM. So if you have, uh, you know, learning programs for new hams, uh, this is a great thing. It's a good thing for, for uh, even not non-hams in general, like, you know, science, high school science. Um, and it's a kind of a cool uh, pathway potentially to peak interest in ham radio, so that's kind of nice. So what about APRS? Well, there isn't an APRS.fi kind of like system yet to do this. I mean, yes, we have maps and stuff, but you have to he you have to be in range to hear it and see it today. There's not enough of these installations yet, so you know you can't drive from one end of your state to the other end of the state or you know or province um, to. Uh, to be able to, you know, and follow somebody's route across this. There's just not enough of these installations. And again, we don't have this, you know, uh, centralized reporting thing really yet. Uh, may come in the future, so stay tuned for that. But the cool thing is you can track people and assets and cars and, and whatnot uh, in fixed-placed uh, locations as well as uh, weather stations and stuff uh, as long as they're in range or you've got them linked some ho somehow over the Internet. Uh, you know, using you know, MQTT. Uh, so this is this is kind of neat. So it sort of works like APRS. So as I said earlier, it's sort of like a modern day RPS, uh, a modern day APRS. Uh, the cool thing about this is that they run forever. Again, you measure these things in days and weeks um, if you're not solar powered. And if you're solar paneled, uh, they can last forever. Now, if you throw, if, if you're going to have something that's going to have GPS on board, so not from a phone, but like something that's a pure tracker without any uh, any um, outside like Bluetooth connection, then, you know, it's going to require more power in order to power that GPS unit. So bigger batteries, bigger solar panel, more power. Uh, kind of cool thing is that you have the ability to bring this, bring APRS-like functionality to non-HAMS and your served agencies. You know, one could easily think of like, say, hey, listen, I want to have... I, uh, maybe you have an agency, and that agency has cash units, so you, so, and they have cash units that they're going to deploy. They're non ham ham related items, but they want to track them, and they want to track who's set up where, and whatnot. You could literally throw a whole bunch of these things in here, and when they go pick up the cash, you just yank these things off the battery charger, and they start broadcasting, and they last forever. Uh, you know, they last for you know a long time at least, and then once you get there, you can plug them in. Lots of cool things you can do with these things. Uh, there's some. Uh, kind of a final thing, there's, there's this concept or this program that a bunch of people are putting together that's uh, what I'm calling like emer emerging network management. So here, uh, this is very similar to what you see in the existing software. This is a third-party software not, uh, specifically run by and endorsed by Mestastic. But here you can see there's a base of operations. You can see people, the selected node in blue that's highlighted. You can see the battery. They're, you know, they're moving at four miles an hour heading heading north, northeast. You can see they're lat long. Um, you can see additional information. At, at some point in the future, you'll be able to remotely flash these things, I believe. Um, so if you were to, you know, you'd be able to see this stuff on in various different ways, but they're kind of hidden. You have to kind of go click through them to find it in the existing software. But here, these guys are coming up with like a whole display panel. So you can kind of see, you know, get a visualized component to all this stuff. And you can think of where this is going, like, you know, maybe you have a screen at an emergency operations center and you could just pop this up and you could see the location of all of your assets and any weather stations and whatnot. Um, 
throughout it. Plus, you could see uh, you know citizen nodes if you wanted as well. So anyway, interesting information. So where do you go to get more information? We go to meshtastic.org. There's a discourse. Uh, it's like a forum that you can go in that's very popular. Uh, there's a uh, somewhat long overview video from just a few days ago uh, f from Twit TV uh, that's listed here. And uh, they go in, it's a couple of the developers um, who talk about the history and uh, it's a nice little, nice commentary about the whole thing. And then if you just want to see uh, somebody just set up raw hardware without any cases and, and talk back and forth, there's a, a, an older video uh, that someone did for this as well. Anyway, I hope this was uh, useful to you and, you know, uh, let me know if, uh, let me know if